We are in the book of 1 John. We're finishing up today 1 John, and we're in chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, we'd like to invite you to open with us to 1 John uh, chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love from God or for God. To obey his commands And his commands are not burdensome, but everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. All three are in agreement. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three are in agreement. And we accept man, uh, a man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because is the testimony, it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. Everyone who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's interesting as we read about overcoming the world. The only way that we can overcome the world is to receive the testimony from God about His Son, Jesus. What does God say about Jesus? It says three times in this passage that we just read, that God has a testimony about His Son, Jesus. God has a testimony about His Son, Jesus. God has a testimony, and God has a testimony. You wonder what God is saying about His Son, Jesus Christ. You can read many different authors, and they all have a testimony of who they might believe Jesus to be. And you have testimonies of people who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ of God. They believe he was Lucifer's brother. They believe that he was a good man. He was a good prophet. But God says something different. And John writes to his hearers and he says, if you really want to connect with God, if you want to know that you have eternal life, you need to receive what God says about his son, Jesus the Christ. And what does God say in his testimony about his son, Jesus Christ? Well, you have the witness of the Godhead. And he writes here that Jesus came by water and blood. And then he goes and he says, and he did not come by water only, but water and blood. And this, the Spirit who testifies. Now he's saying God is threefold. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God the Father bears witness by water and blood that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the Spirit bears witness as God, the third person of the Trinity, that Jesus is God in the flesh and that he is, the, that he is Jesus, the Christ of God. And so you have this threefold witness of the Godhead, bearing witness to who Jesus is. And if you're listening to anyone Other than those three witnesses, you may come up with a different conclusion about who you say Jesus is. You know, in our culture today, it's almost as if everyone has their own philosophy about everything. 
And it's kind of weird when you chat with someone, if they don't quite agree with your philosophy, you can argue philosophies, but I have a right to my own opinion and my own philosophy. But your opinion does not give a squirt of anything compared to what God says. I really don't care uh, your great philosophy. You know, there are so many people that, you know, we drive in a drive through and we order a burger our way. And we have that kind of same philosophy about, you know, approaching God. It's like, well, you know, I believe Buddha's got a little something to say here, and Confucius has a little bit of something, and Muhammad certainly has something to say here, and, and uh, the people, you know, the animistic people believe this, and they have a little something to say. So I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have my own design of religion, and after all, I'm very clever, and I came up with my own religion. Oh, you're so impressive. But do you what God has to say about his son? Because this is how you're going to be judged. What does God say about his son, and how are you responding to God's witness about his own son? It really doesn't matter, you know, even what I say. Unless I'm in agreement with God, it doesn't really carry any weight. But if we stand in the truth, God backs the truth. And he'll back you if you stand in the truth as well. And he said, I'll go with you as long as you're going in my commission, preaching the gospel as I declare it. I'll go with you. If you want to design your own religion, uh, you have perfect freedom to do that. I bless you to just do that. You just design your own religion and uh, I will also bless you to face the judgment with no, you know, with you having no designer uh, judgment. You have a judgment that you will have whether you like it or not. You have no choice in the judgment if you reject God's witness. And so John is just telling these dear people who love God to stay focused and receive the witness of God. And when you receive the witness of God, you have God's backing. You have God's uh, witness. And so he's writing about the witness and the belief is in Jesus Christ. How does God judge you? Is it going to be because you stand before him and you say, well, you know, I had, I had good moral standing and, and um, I followed Confucius and I followed Buddhists and he's going, well, I'm really impressed. Is, is that what you're expecting to happen at uh, the judgment? Well, it tells us here that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. God really is more concerned that you are born of him. And how do you experience this new birth? It's by believing in Jesus. It's not by doing, it's by believing. And you see, we want to complicate things so much, and it's too easy just to believe. And it's too easy just to think that I'm a sinner, and I know that, and I have guilt, but that Jesus came as the God wrapped in flesh, and he died in my place so that I could have his righteousness. That's just almost too good to be true. But it's all God is really asking you to do is believe. He that believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's how you get born again. You believe your way into a new birth. You believe what God says. You believe the witness of God. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands. This is the love of God to obey His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. If you're born of God, you have a new nature, a new desire, and it came when you trusted God rather than your own abilities to um, come up to make yourself righteous. And if you believe that, you're born of God. And when you're born of God, you overcome the world because the greater seed of God in you is greater than the seed that's in the world. And you overcome them by how? Your works? No, your faith, your belief in what God says. He who overcomes the world, only, only he who believes that Jesus is the Christ. How do you overcome the world? You say, well, pastor, the world sucks. And I agree that it pretty well, you know, it, 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 it does. Man has really, we are really good at, at spoiling a lot of good, aren't we? And there's a lot of bad in the world. But people who are born of God have a way to initiate and bring God in goodness into this world that is so bad. And the good thing is, is if you believe and you're born of God, 
your faith in God, your belief in God starts manifesting goodness, and it's like God is coming through you, creating an aroma of goodness right through you because you're now born of God. And you just can't struggle and strain. It's natural for you to do good things because of your new nature. And when we're following our new nature, we do those things that please God. God shows up on this planet that seems so destitute and so hopeless. God shows up and he says, no, look, I'm here. The evil around me does not, uh, you know, doesn't make me shiver. I'm not afraid of it. I'll go with you into wherever dark corner of the world you want to go or that I will lead you and I will produce something in you that's so much beyond you that you'll just be astounded. How does it come that you overcome the world? By believing in God. Believing in Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah. Only he who believes, verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we have this threefold witness of God. And God says, now, what do you, you want to know what I say about Jesus? There's three things I say. Now, nobody really knows what's in John's mind. You know, I was reading different commentaries, and everybody's got their opinion on what um, John is saying. And I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> no, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to weigh in. I'm going to weigh in uh, with others, and I'll tell you a couple of things that uh, people are saying. What does it mean that Jesus came, uh, and and what is the witness of the water and the blood? What is that all about? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Well, different uh, theologians, different commentators say that uh, Jesus came um, born of his mother, and there's the embryonic water, and there's the blood and the goo that goes with the natural birthing process. And there are theologians that say that Jesus came as a human being, and the water and the blood authenticate that he's not some, you know, God who is not in touch with man, that he actually, like the Gnostics would say, all oh, flesh is evil and my body is evil, so I'm not going to give it, you know, my body, I'm going to starve it to get, you know, and I'm going to sit in the sun and look at the sun and burn my eyeballs out because it's only flesh and no flesh is good. And, and the Gnostics kind of had this thing and, and, and they say, well, you know, God is really saying that, no, I did come and participate in manhood and I became a man and the water and the blood speak of my human birth and I as God took on human form without, this, without ceasing to be God, I became man. And some say that that's what the water and blood is. And they quote scriptures about um, God speaking about Israel when they were in Egypt. He said, didn't I bring you out like uh, kicking in blood and water like a birth? You know? And so they say, well, that's what that means. And then another commentary would say, no, no, no. It's the water of Jesus' baptism that God came and bore witness of his son when he was in the water. When he came up out of the water in Matthew chapter 3, I believe it's Luke 3, Matthew 3, three things happened. One is the heavens opened and there was no barrier between God and man. It's like the favorable year of the God has begun. God has opened the heavens over mankind, but it's open over his son Jesus. The heavens opened. Number two, the Spirit of God came and descended on Jesus and stayed on him, and he was empowered from that moment on by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Spirit at his birth because he was conceived of the virgin, of the seed of God, uh, giving giving Mary's um, egg divine nature. And he was born of the Spirit, but now he's baptized in the Spirit, just like It is for you and I. When you're born again, you're born of the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, it's this crisis point in time when the Spirit of God comes on you and empowers you. And no one can really argue that Jesus was not doing a lot of ministry and and a lot of powerful things before his baptism. It was his baptism that plunged him in to his public ministry. And we all pretty well agree on that. And so... There are theologians that say Jesus was, God bore witness that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's the third thing that happened. That is baptism number one, the heavens opened. Man had never had an open heaven over him before with God's favor coming on man since his sin. 
There were spots of rays coming through the dark shadows of God coming on a prophet speaking, God doing this over here in a battle, God doing this over there. But the open heavens over mankind had never been seen to the effect that it had been when Jesus was baptized and the heavens opened over him. And now there was an open heaven and there was communion with God and his son. And God was coming down to man, forgiving them their sins, healing them of their diseases, raising their dead, multiplying food. There was this new open heaven over mankind that mankind had really not seen up until that point. There was, secondly, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of uh, a Holy Spirit came on Jesus and rested on him. And he was empowered and he went into the synagogue after being tempted. He was led by the spirit into the wilderness and he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights And he emerged only to go into a synagogue, open the the scroll to the day's reading, and he was called upon to read, and it was Isaiah 61.1. And you know, the Jews have this reading throughout the year, kind of like the liturgical church had the calendar year. The Jews had their reading through, you know, the Pentateuch and the Psalms and And they would read the prophets, the Psalms, and the Pentateuch, and they would read these things in uh, a year's calendar. And Jesus walked in on the day that, that Saturday, that, you know, Friday night it begins through Saturday, and he opened it up, and there today's reading was, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. He has anointed me to do what? to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, recovery of sight to the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set uh, captives free. And he said, today, 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 this is fulfilled now today in your hearing, and you're seeing it happen. We're reading Isaiah 61.1, and it's happening according to the calendar year. And much of Jesus' miracles and all that he did were in relation to the, the sort of Jewish calendar of Feast and festivals and different events were, that were on the Jewish calendar year. And Jesus would walk and do those things and fulfill what was being read in the synagogue as a witness that the word of God is coming, but the living word is doing it. Do you see? what? Are you following me? And so God bore witness at Jesus' baptism by saying, there's an open heaven, I'm sending the Spirit, He's going to rest on you. And Jesus, therefore, from that point on, The source of his miracles, the source of his empowerment was not that he was God, but it was that the Spirit of God was upon him. He accepted the limitations of human flesh, but depended on the Spirit like you and I would, that God's Spirit would empower him to heal. God's Spirit would empower him to preach. God's Spirit would empower him to raise the dead. Just like it is with you and I. We have no power in ourselves, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we, can, we move from Clark Kent to Superman, and so it was with Jesus. He was anointed by God, and he said sometimes there was great power present to heal them all. And sometimes he could not do many works in those places. Why? Because it was all related to what the Spirit was doing and empowering Jesus for that moment, and, and it was according to the calendar year. And he was the living word, as the written word was read, he was the living example of the fulfillment of God's word. So God bore witness by the Spirit, and God bore witness by saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. He bore witness with his voice crashing through the heavens. Don't you wish sometimes God would just speak so clearly, it would just crash through the heavens in your darkness and your confusion, and he said, you are my son. I'm well pleased. And you see all those around are like, whoa, did you hear that? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So they say that God's witness, the witness of the Godhead was that the Spirit came on Jesus, the Spirit bore witness because he came on Jesus, The voice from heaven was heard saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And this is the witness of the Godhead. The water, the spirit, and the blood. Now I want you to go with me, turn back in your Bibles if you would, put your finger in 1 John, and let's go to the Gospel of John. Some people say that The epistle of John is a commentary on the gospel of John. And I don't know. I guess that's okay. I've never really given it a lot of thought. But it's kind of cool to think that it might be. I don't know. 
that I'm going to stand there and announce that to you, but the guys in the teaching pool are jazzed about it, so I better say something to you so that you don't get left out. <laughs> uh, in John chapter 1, verse uh, 29, and this is John the Baptist's account of how God dealt with him and told him his mission and how he would then recognize Jesus, the coming Messiah, because he was coming to announce one greater than himself. How would he recognize this Christ? Well, this is how it happened, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I met when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, do you remember he was... John the Baptist was born first, and then Jesus was born because Mary came to uh, Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John, and uh, she was far along, and Jesus uh, was just conceived in Mary, and, but now John is saying, but he's before all time. <laughs> this is really a witness of the preexistence of Jesus Christ before his birth, you see. When John said... Uh, he surpassed me because he was before me. Those are interesting words. I myself did not know, but the reason I came baptizing with what? Water. So here we have the witness of water. I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. The reason I came baptizing is so that Jesus would be revealed to all of Israel. Well, that doesn't make sense, but it does when you think of Jesus coming up out of the water he came to John and says, I want you to baptize me. He said, what, me baptize you? You should baptize me. He says, no, just, this is God's will. Forbid, don't forbid it. Just do what God says and you'll be blessed. And so as he baptized Jesus and he came up out of the water, the heavens opened, the spirit descended, and the voice of God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, that was John's sign. And that was the sign to Israel of God's witness of the Christ, Jesus being the Messiah that God was revealing through water baptism. Now watch this. John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Now, I tend to take the stance, and I'll tell you the truth about the water. It's not maybe, I, I like them all. I think that maybe Jesus came in the sign of water. Yes, he was human flesh. But John tells us, the one who sent me on my mission to reveal the Christ, the anointed one from God, uh, sent me to baptize, so that when I baptized him, the Spirit came on him, and that's what I was looking for, because God told me, when you baptize him, whoever you see the Holy Spirit come on, stay on, that's the Christ. Now I want you to reveal that to Israel. So there's the sign of God's threefold witness, the Spirit, the open sky, and the voice of God the Father saying, this is my son, in case you missed that Spirit coming, and the skies parting, that's him, and I'm bearing witness. So God bore witness at water, at the baptism of Jesus, when John baptized Jesus. Isn't that cool? The cool thing is about the Bible is we think, well, Revelation, it's like, well, if you understand the rest of Scripture, it just fits together so nicely. And if you find Scriptures like this, you say, well, what is the water? And it's like, well, oh, there it is right there. And yeah, I think it could be his human birth, but I also think the really chose his baptism in water to bring his witness of his voice and the Spirit. Okay? Now, there is this witness of the Godhead here, the witness of the water. There's the witness of the Spirit. Now, at, we just said at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit said, yep, it's him. I'm coming on him. <laughs> And I'm doing it in a visible way. I'm coming on him in the form of a dove. It wasn't a dove like Hollywood would. And, you know, because that's not cool because every time I've been around a dove, I get pooped on. So 
you know, the doesn't really do much for me, but the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and rested on him and stayed on him. It was not a dove, it was the Holy Spirit in the form of. What looked like the form of a dove, but wasn't a dove, came on Jesus visibly, and we recognized it, and that's how I knew that it was the Christ. You see? Now, the second thing I want you to get here about this is that the Spirit bore witness of Jesus being the Christ by coming on him in his water baptism. But the second thing I want you to realize is that the Spirit has also sent a witness to the world today in which you and I live. Since Jesus has taken up, he said, you know, it's to your advantage that I go to be with my Father. Because if I go to be with my Father, I will ask him to send another comforter, one who walks beside you. And he will be, he's with you now, but he will be in you and he'll be with you and he'll bear witness, and he'll remind you of the things I said, and he will empower you. And I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you're clothed with this power from on high. Don't leave and try to do the Great Commission until you get the Holy Spirit sign from heaven. Now in Acts chapter 2, we read about that sign coming on the church, which is the transition of, of Jesus' body in the river, being baptized, and now we are the body of Christ, and in Acts chapter 2, we read these words that on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost uh, had fully come, something happened. There was a noise from heaven, like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And all who heard it ran together to hear, to see where the noise was coming from. What is coming from heaven? And then what happened? There was a noise from heaven in chapter 2 of, uh, of Acts. And then there was this noise, and then there was this cloven tongues of fire which divided and rested on different people, and they began to speak in a language that they had not learned. It was so crazy sign, it was such a crazy sign that people said, these guys are just drunk, because we hear them talking in our language, and they're praising God, and they shouldn't ought to be hitting the booze before they praise God. Because anytime God moves in a supernatural way, there will be men who want to reduce God to an understandable package that they can package God in this nice little box saying, you know what that is? That's drunkenness. And Peter stands up and he said, no, it's not. It's only nine in the morning. You know, we're not alcoholics. And we haven't had anything to drink yet today. This is what was spoken in the prophet Joel. And he goes right to the book of Joel and he opens it up and he says, the spirit of the Lord has been prophesied through the book of Joel to come, and this is what we're receiving today. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Old men will see dreams. Young men, you know, see visions. And it will come on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. I like that he included the daughters in there, don't you, ladies? Oh, I almost sounded excited there. <laughs> This is a sign from heaven, you see. And the Spirit comes and said, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I am going to do the same thing with the church that I did with Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed the church to do the mission of Christ. And so when the apostles received the Holy Spirit, the cowardness of them hiding at the crucifixion of Christ, they were seen hiding in fear of the Jews, are coming out of their hiding, they're being empowered by Jesus and saying, you killed the Christ. And he has not left himself without witness. And we bear witness and testify, and so does the Holy Spirit. This man that you see standing whole before you that was crippled from birth stands whole because of the name of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit is bearing witness through us now. The very works that Jesus began to do and that's what it says in Acts chapter 1. I love that. The first account I gave, O Theophilus, Luke writes, in my gospel, Luke, I began to write about all that Jesus began, but didn't finish, began to do and teach until the day he was taken up from us. He now completes and he continues to do and teach through his church. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is given as a sign. And the works that we do in the power of the Holy Spirit bear witness that the Spirit says Jesus is the Christ. And when we pray for the sick and when we 
speak to obstacles in the way, and God breaks through them in Jesus' name. Jesus' name is glorified, and the Spirit bears witness at the name of Jesus when great things happen at your prayers and your living and your believing. So we have the witness of water in Jesus' baptism. Yes, he was purely human, purely God. But at his baptism, the heavens were open, the Spirit came, the, the voice from God said, this is my Son, this is the witness of water. And the witness of the Spirit is that Jesus received the Spirit, and it was by the Spirit that he began to do and teach what he did and taught. And now the Holy Spirit has that same Spirit to do and teach as Jesus taught, and he goes with us to the end of the earth. How? By his Spirit. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we have the witness of water, we have the witness of the Spirit, and we have the witness of the blood of Jesus at his death. Today we celebrate communion. Some people believe that Jesus mystically joins you as you partake of the wafer, and we're going to ask you to grab one wafer, dip it, no double dipping, dip it, put it in your mouth. There's going to be an aisle down both middle, and then when the next position opens at one of these four things, you just step up there, you take it. Someone will be there to pronounce like a little blessing and benediction over you. And if you want more prayer, go to the sides, and we'll have anointing for healing and, and issues of struggle, and we're going to do this together. But part of the thing that we're celebrating communion today, I thought it would be a great day to take the Lord's table, was because the witness of the blood of Christ, and you know, this is kind of strange to you, and me, it's not, but to the world, they think we're nuts. What is with these Christians who partake in wine that they say is a symbol, or as the Catholic Church believes, when the priest blesses it, it becomes the blood of Christ and the body of Christ, and the Lutherans believe that when you ingest it, it becomes that, and we believe that it's just a symbolic thing, but Jesus meets us when we recognize that our trust in salvation is not in my own ability to please God, but in God's ability as he sought us as a lost sheep. He left those 99, he came and he sought me and he died and he paid for my sins. And the blood that he shed as he broke this out to the apostles on that day, he said this, he said, look, as often as you drink this drink and eat this bread. You do this in remembrance of me until I come back. So the coming back of Jesus should be clear to us. You shouldn't feel guilty and say, well, I'm not good enough to take communion. That's why you need communion, because you're not good enough. Are you with me? God isn't here to make you feel bad and rehearse your sins. He's here to say, leave it behind. I've, my blood has cleansed you. Accept my cleansing. Walk away from your guilt. Come, partake of my table. And I like to think of the bread when I take it. I like to think that that this is a symbol of the body of Christ, and as I partake it, I'm acknowledging that I am a part of the body of Christ. And as I dip, as I dip it in the wine, or the juice, I don't know what we have, I don't care, and you shouldn't either. As I dip it in there, I realize that my being a part of the body of Christ must be emerged in the covenant of Jesus Christ. And his blood not only forgives me, but it empowers me to be the body of Christ. And so when we take, just take that. And we believe that by his stripes and his atoning work and his shed blood, there's a witness that God wants to give you today at the Lord's table. It's the witness of his blood to forgive you. It's the witness of his blood to heal you. It's the witness of his blood to empower you. And so when we take this, I want you to think about this blood thing that, that is referred to in 1 John chapter 5 because the blood... Do you remember when Jesus died and he's dying on the cross and he's bleeding? Now, it's odd for the world to view us glorifying the blood and the cross. Ooh, if you're not a Christian, ooh, the blood of Jesus, you're happy, you're celebrating blood? What kind of slaughterhouse cannibalistic religion do you have? And they don't understand. It's the blood of Jesus that I'm now free. And when Jesus was dying on the cross, four things happened that God came in immediate witness. And I like this, I like that my favorite story of the crucifixion is the guy who wasn't probably even looking for God, the centurion who's observing, is watching it happen. 
And suddenly it's midday, it's the brightest part of day, and it becomes pitch black. As Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it becomes pitch black. Right there at the brightest point of the day, and everyone's freaking out. And the centurion's going, what is going on? He cried out and it became black, as if God has covered him and can't look at him as the sins of man are being poured out on Jesus. God cannot look at the sins of man. He baptizes Jesus, and all of our sins and our iniquities were poured out on Jesus. And, and it was almost like God put darkness between the cross and himself. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what was the second thing that happened? There was an earthquake, and the rock split. It's like nature and God gave the sign of an earthquake. As if nature and God were responding to what was being done on the cross, and the earth quaked. And then centurions, you know. And then there's a report as somebody comes running, the veil in the temple has been torn from the top to the bottom, and they're trying to sew it back up. Stay away. God tore the veil in the temple as if to say, you know the wall of separation between you and me? This price of blood has torn that, and now you have access to God the Father straight on without a priest. Straight on. Because God has ripped it and said, no more separation. The blood of Christ has atoned for your sins. You come into my presence made clean and made holy through the blood of Jesus my Son. And God is celebrating and is offering this to you today. Yeah. And then what happened? It became dark in the middle of the day. The rocks quaked. The veil in the temple was torn. Those are three signs, but one more thing happened. It says in Matthew, I think it's chapter 27 there, it said the tombs of the Old Testament saints were opened and they were walking around the city as if Jesus' death ended death. The death of Christ became the death of death and the death of man. You like that? It would be a good title if I could remember it. <laughs> the death of death and the death of Christ. And the tombs were open. And now there's hope for all who have died because he has gone, he has paid the price. He goes to the lower parts, the regions of the world. It, uh, it talks as, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the, uh, in the belly of the well, so must the Son of Man be in the center of the earth. Ephesians 4 tells us that he led captivity, cap, he took it captive and led them out in a train. So Jesus goes and announces to Abraham's bosom and all the Old Testament saints there's now new hope for life, and I'm taking you out of Abraham's bosom. I'm taking you to heaven. You can't go ahead of me, but I'm going to take you with me to heaven. So the, the paradise region in the center that we read about in Luke, where the rich man and Lazarus died, and one is carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, is now taken out of there, the center part of the earth, as Jesus goes in this, and he announces freedom. You guys, it's time to go to heaven, and he takes them with him, and he goes to heaven. And today they wait. But they were coming out of their tombs and saying, dude, we're alive. This is Jerusalem. What a witness of God's blood. The, the blood of Christ as a witness that affected the under regions and death and hell itself. So we have these signs and God has borne witness. And that centurion says, surely this was the Son of God. You know, I can just picture John Wayne. <laughs> Surely this was. Can you hear him say it? Hey, pony soldier. <laughs> this was the Son of God. And God has brought to you a witness. And if you believe that witness, you will overcome the world. Now he has some nice closing remarks that I want to just briefly touch on because I want time for worship and communion here. Verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you get eternal life? You believe your way into it, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So that you may know. God wants you to have an assurance that you know. I tell people, you know... It's fun on airplanes, I don't know why, but you go to take off. And I, I never, I don't ever, I'm never afraid of flying. 
unless it gets weird on the landing or something. But you tell people, you know, if you get, if you get the opportunity you're sharing, you know, so I know I'm going to. How do you know? You can't know. These things have I written to you who believe that you may know and have assurance of eternal life. If you do not have assurance today that you know Jesus, you can believe your way in and come to say, just come to the table. And when you come, say, you know, this is my first communion to know Jesus. And you can meet Jesus right here. And on his terms, what a better time to meet him rather than an altar call just as I am, the 15th verse that you get saved on. Wouldn't it be cool if this is your day that you could come to have the assurance that Jesus' blood has shed for me, I accept it, I take it, and I know I'm his. And I now have this new assurance in my heart. And I have believed, and therefore I receive. These things have I written to you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything to his will, he hears us. And we know that when he hears us, we have whatever we ask. We know that we have, uh, we know that what we have asked of him. Anyway, you get what you pray for. <laughs> I'm such a bad reader. I just cannot do this very well. When I ask according to Jesus' will, God hears me and we get it. You know, prayer is so different when you have an assurance that God wants it more than you. You know, when I think of back, the whole lesson of God giving us the roaster because he wanted it more than us, it doesn't matter what we come into. God's will may be crazy different for you. And you should be able, through the blood of Christ, the witness of God, you should be able to come to him and have assurance in your heart that God wants you to bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit, and so prove to be his disciple. Do you know as you sit here and you come up to this table today, I want you to have, as you take it and you recognize you're a part of the body, you're dipping it in the blood, the covenant that's forgiven your sins, the, the power that's there to empower you as the body of Christ, that God wants you to bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. And so it's to glorify him. And I say, well, I don't want to bear fruit. I don't want to get arrogant. It's like, no, no, God wants you to bear much fruit to prove to be his disciples so that God can show himself to the world of people around you. And so it is that most of us are afraid to ask God for, for anything big. But I have learned this, that if God wants his will more than I want his will, the normal Christian life is going to be crazy miracles, day in and day out. I pray, Lord, I want to meet someone today and talk to them about you. And guess what? It's probably God's will that that happen. And if I watch and pray, God will answer that prayer because it's his will. It doesn't matter if, we, if, we, if God wants vecinos more than we have and we need a place to do it, a, you know, a free place with, with funding from the building to support it. And if, and if God wants a, to plop a million-dollar building on us and say, here, I want to give you this because you're called according to my purposes, I will give you whatever you need. I want you to take the bread and the cup and I want you to think it's God's will and I should have assurance that when I'm praying in God's will, now you could pray for, you know, the cool airplane that I want or the Porsche or whatever and I might not get that. It may not be God's will that I have a Porsche. It may get, be God's will for me to get a Buick. <laughs> and someday I'm going to just surprise all of you. And I'm going to sit out and tell the world that Buicks do go fast. <laughs> okay? What am I praying that's God's will and what am I praying for my will that I may consume it on my lust? The best thing God could do is say no to me when I'm moving in the wrong direction. But when I'm connected with God and I'm praying and say, oh God, you probably don't want to give us this building, but it sure would be nice. It's like, no, no, no. When you're praying in God's will, you're going to expect God to move and give you things that look more like God giving them than you getting them yourself. And that glorifies God. Will you do that? Will you say, here's the thing. What, if I, if I could do anything I wanted and I know that God would bless me and, and I wouldn't fail, what would I want? And he prunes you and he strips away the stuff 
you're going to be praying God's will. And what crazy thing of God's will he could release to you as you meet him at his table today? What crazy thing might God do? Don't think small. Do not think small. The early church got their minds blown time after time after time because God wanted things more than they wanted them. Oh, I know I should... If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray for him that God will give him life. I refer to those sins... Um, I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. And the one who is born of God keeps him safe. And the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are the children of God, and the whole world lies under the control of the evil one. You know, Satan, the whole world system, the reason it sucks is that it lies under the power of the devil, the evil one. But we're born of God, and we overcome that. And we become unsuccessful at sinning because God's witness and God's seed in us is greater than the seed of our old nature that wants to sin. And so if you see a brother in sin, there's a, there is the restoration that God gives to the body of Christ to restore the one. And I've restored others and I've been restored myself. And I praise God for the community of faith that sees things, calls them out, and, and God blesses through that. But there is a sin that leads to death. And if someone will not repent, like in the case of 1 Corinthians 5, 5, the guy who was living with his stepmother, gross, is, you know, is not repenting. And Paul says, turn him over to Satan that, is, that the destruction of his flesh so his spirit can be saved. Well, don't, don't pray. Just let him go. Let him get what he thinks he really wants until he's sick of it. And when he comes back, I will accept him. And what happened in 2 Corinthians? He repented. It doesn't mean that you should not pray for somebody. And I don't want you to come to the table and say, well, I've committed a sin that leads to death and there's no hope for me. No, no. If you're here and you're desiring God, that's not the case. Repentant people are welcome to come to the Lord's table because they need it. So I don't want you to feel that guilt, but when you see a brother or sister stumbling, go restore that person in the name of Christ. And if they turn, you've won that brother. If they harden their heart, then God will deal with them. And God probably won't answer your prayer to save them from harm. You know, they might, you know, they might get disciplined by God because they're unrepentant, but God can bring his own children back. Amen. And so we trust him for that. Now, we're going to ask the band to come and we're going to take communion and we're going to have people at each station. There'll be a couple of people at each station and um, they're going to pronounce a blessing over you, kind of a benediction. And if they are quickened by the Holy Spirit and get something, they will share that with you. If you want extended prayer for anything specific, spiritual, physical, you may go to the side and there'll be people to pray with you. I'm going to... Ask the people now who are going to come and be at the stations to come now. And as we're worshiping the Lord, um, you can come and uh, just form two aisles down the middle. And when you're done, go down the side aisles. There'll be less confusion. And they'll open up fast because there'll be, uh, this aisle will have, you know, we'll be able to do four people at a time and that aisle will. So it'll move real fast. Let's stand together. If you're not a Christian, you can come and take and say, this is my first communion where I understand my need for the blood. And you come and you take. Okay? Come on, sinners. Pour me Weak and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus ready, stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. Come and welcome, God 
hearts be bounty glorify true belief and true repentance every grace that brings you nigh I will I will arise. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand charms. Oh, there
clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another and give us clean
Um, may the Lord Jesus put hope in your heart as you leave this place today. May you experience him and his richness and his full acceptance of you as his children. May his eyes meet yours and may it even in jealousy burn the cords that restrict you from being who he's made you to be. May God richly bless you 
as you meet with him this week in the word. And may God fill you with his spirit to meet the needs of those around you, we pray. Amen.